Okay, so in this video, we will solve the following linear system in three equations and three variables. As always, we first construct the augmented matrix of the system. And we always want to get a leading one in the top row in the, if possible, the leftmost column. So here we could rewrite the equations as they are, but we can do slightly better if we simply write the third equation instead of the first and vice versa. This will already give us a leading one in the top row. So we have one, negative one, one, negative one, the third equation, and we'll simply rewrite the first two equations in the bottom two rows. Two, negative two, four, ten. 3, negative 3, 6, 15. As we have said, we already have our leading 1, and now we can kill the entries below it. So we'll do row 2, minus 2, row 1, row 3, minus 3, row 1. We can recopy the first row as we're not changing it. Let's apply the first row operation. 2 minus 2 is 0. Negative 2, negative 2 times negative 1 is plus 2 is 0. 4 minus 2, positive 2. 10 minus 2 times negative 1 plus 2 is 12. Second row operation, 3 minus 3 is 0. Negative 3 minus negative 3 times negative 1 is plus 3 is 0. 6 minus 3, positive 3. And finally, 15 minus 3 times negative 1 is plus 3 gives us 18. So we have our first leading 1. We've killed the entries below it. We ignore and we move on. We try starting from the leftmost column to get a leading one in the top row. Both entries are zero, we can't get the leading one. Both entries here are zero, we can't get a leading one. Both entries here are non-zero, and we can get our leading one easily in the top row now. And if you notice, we can multiply by one half as 12 is divisible by two, and at the same time we could, if we wanted, multiply by one over three, because 18 is also divisible by 3. So we'll do 1 half of row 2 and 1 third of row 3. This will make the calculation slightly easier. So we can recopy the first row. And now we apply the first row operation, which gives us 1 and then 6. This is our second leading one. Multiply row three by one third gives us zero, zero, one, six. We have our second leading one. We kill the entries below. This is quite simple. Row three minus row two. We can recopy the first two rows as we're not changing them. And now we apply row 3 minus row 2, and if you notice, the entire third row becomes a row of zeros. And this is no problem, right? It says 0 times z, 0 times x, sorry, plus 0 times y, plus 0 times z. No matter how you choose x, y, and z, this is always 0. And this must equal 0. So this is a simply a vacuous row. All it says is 0 equals 0, which is vacuous. So there's no problem. And this completes Gaussian elimination. Right? We've had our leading one in the top row, kill the entries below. Second leading one in the top row, kill the entries below. And there are no other possible leading ones. So this is the end of Gaussian elimination.
we've obtained every possible leading one, we've killed all the entries below the leading ones, and if there are a row of zeros, which there is one in this case, they're all at the bottom. Now the question is, what do we do from this point on? Before we had unique solutions, and so we used backward substitution. But if you notice, we have a leading one for x and a leading one for y. Let me just remind you that this is the column for x, column for y, column for z. So we have a leading one for x, a leading one for z. So both x and z are leading variables, but y does not have a leading one. So y actually is a free variable. Now because the system is consistent, having a free variable implies that we will get a parameter which will give us an infinite number of solutions. So here we do not want to use backward substitution. We will use instead Gauss-Jordan elimination. Now a bit of terminology. Every time you row reduce a matrix and you stop with Gaussian elimination, so every possible leading one, you've killed the entries below, if there are row of zeros, they're at the bottom, this form of the matrix has a special name. It's called row echelon form. So the matrix now, at this point, once we're done with Gaussian elimination, is in so-called row echelon form. That is the result of applying Gaussian elimination. Now, as we have just said, x and z are leading variables. Because they both possess a leading one, so they are leading variables, we can solve for those. Because y does not have a leading variable, y is called a free variable. And we use the term free because y can actually take on any real value of our choice, hence the word free. But there's still a question remaining. Do we simply now use backward substitution? The answer is we could. We could label y, say, as t, as y is a free variable, it becomes a parameter that can take on any real value of our choice, and then use backward substitution. But because there's a z here, this will imply a little bit of algebra. And the same thing here for the negative 1. We can do a little better if we complete what's called Gauss-Jordan elimination. And this will give us a matrix in so-called reduced Reuschelon form. So now we apply Gauss-Jordan. Let me simply recopy our augmented matrix, which is at the end of Gaussian elimination in row echelon form. Now, all that Gauss-Jordan elimination is is working backwards. If you see, the first step was to introduce leading ones and introduce zeros below the leading ones. Now Gauss-Jordan elimination says, once you're done with Gaussian elimination, start with the last leading one, the leading one in the bottom row, and now introduce, leading, introduce zeros above the leading one. So we've killed all the entries below our leading ones. We will not kill the entries above the leading ones, working from the last leading one and working our way up to the very first leading one. So this is quite easy. To kill this one, we simply do row 1 minus row 2. We can recopy the bottom two rows as we're not changing them. And now we apply a row operation, so 1 minus 1 is 1 negative 1 minus 0, uh, 1 minus 0 is 1, negative 1 minus 0, negative 1, 1 minus 1, 0, negative 1, negative 6, negative 7. And if you notice now, every entry above our last leading one is equal to 0. Now we would move on to our next leading one, 
and make everything above equal to zero, as there is nothing above, then we're done. If we had a larger matrix, and this one, say, had other entries above it, then we would kill all of the entries above, and then work our way up to our last leading one. Not only having all the entries below being ones, being zeros, but all the entries above being zeros as well. And this completes Gauss-Jordan elimination. Now we give this matrix a special name that is so-called a reduced row echelon form. And that is a result of introducing also above every leading one all zeros. And don't forget to work your way backwards from the last leading one up to the very first leading one. Now the question is why do we do this? Why do we not simply use backward substitution here? Well at this point you could use backward substitution and I'll let you as an exercise do so and you'll realize that when you write your solution you'll have to do actually extra algebra. It won't be fully simplified. Whereas once you reached the reduced version on the form of the matrix, therefore applying Gauss-Jordan elimination, you can write the solution set and there is no more algebra to be done. It already is fully simplified. So let's do so. So we can now write our solution set. The question is, which variables do we handle first? As there are two types of variables here. There are the leading variables, x and z, and y is a free variable. We always, always handle free variables, assign them parameter values. Since y is free, we will say that y equals t, and we will explicitly state that t can take on any real value of our choice. And then, once you've assigned to each free variable a parameter letter, if you had more than one free variable, you could use R, S, T, and so forth. Then once you've assigned to each free variable a parameter, then you solve for the leading variables. Let us solve for Z using its leading one. So Z equals six. Let us solve for X using its leading one. So X equals negative seven. This is a negative y, which sent to the right side becomes a positive y, but y is t, and so we have positive t. And now we have our general solution, our solution set. For any choice of t, t could be 1.5, 3 over 7, pi. If you replace x by negative 7 plus t, y by t and z by 6, you will have a solution to the original linear system. You can verify this. You can replace x, y, and z by their expression in terms of t, and for any value of t, you will be satisfying every single equation. So every time you have one free variable or more, don't use backward substitution, as this will have you perform more algebra involving the parameters. Instead, use Gauss-Jordan elimination. Introduce above each leading one all zeros, and once you have completed Gauss-Jordan elimination, the matrix is in reduced version form, and you can always write the solution set in its final form, fully simplified, no extra algebra required. And this is why we prefer Gauss-Jordan elimination when we have free variables.